I'm uh, very excited to be presenting Mechanisms for No Regret Agent Beyond the Common Prior. My name is Modibo. I'm an economics PhD student at Northwestern University, and this is joint work with Jason Hartline and Alec Johnson, both at Northwestern. Uh, I'm going to be using colors to highlight ideas in this talk. Um, blue will typically mean a concept from game theory, red a concept from learning theory, purple will be a new concept or definition uh, that we introduce in this work, um, and I'm going to be using highlighting to uh, sort of emphasize important points. Okay, so our starting point is there are many um, you know, economically interesting problems that can be modeled as incomplete information games, where a policymaker commits to some policy and an agent responds. Examples include monopoly regulation, contract design, basic persuasion, delegation, etc. Now, I think as this community sort of is likely to be especially aware, um, classic solutions to these problems within economics require a lot of prior knowledge about the environment. Um, and, and there's been a movement towards uh, solution concepts that are more robust, that require less our knowledge, and you know, hopefully are more credible and more usable. Now, on the other hand, these robust solution concepts can be quite conservative, right? <laughs> if you get rid of all, any prior knowledge, um, so what, what you have left, uh, you know, some worst case optimal uh, policy uh, might not perform as well as you would hope if you had sort of, uh, uh, sort of quite a bit of knowledge about the environment. Um, in many cases, many cases, these solution concepts even lead to sort of trivial solutions. So the question that we're asking here is whether we can um, improve things, right? Whether uh, repeated interaction can make up for a lack of prior knowledge without sort of sacrificing any uh, robustness. And our answer is, is yes, uh, and the reason is because the policymaker is able to adapt to the environment over time. So our contribution, we're going to be studying a repeated game between the policymaker and the agent, where the state of nature is observed at the end of every period. We're going to be developing what we call calibrated policy that the policymaker will not regret using relative to the ex post optimal static policy. And this, uh, our guarantee here, will hold even in poorly understood non-stationary environments or, you know, um, in what you would call adversarial environments. Um, and under permissive behavioral assumptions, assumptions that we sort of introduce in this work, but basically build on existing ideas like no regret and calibration. Now, a question that you might ask at this point is, you know, isn't this a solved problem, right? Why don't existing learning algorithms like exponential weights solve the policymaker's problem? Um, and the, the issue is that these kinds of algorithms um, and a lot of existing work in learning games implicitly treats the agent's behavior as exogenous. Okay. We're going to be clarifying what we mean by that a little bit later. Um, but in this setting, of course, the agent's behavior is going to be endogenous. So we're going to have to do a lot more work to uh, uh, sort of uh, obtain no regret guarantees for the policymaker. Okay, related literature, there's a lot of it. Um, I'll leave you to peruse the slide. Um, or sort of take a look at the paper. Okay, let's talk about the model. So we're going to start with the stage game and then move on to the repeated game. In the stage game, a uh, policymaker is going to commit to some policy P and possibly send a message M to the agent. Okay, why is the policymaker sending a message? Uh, well, you'll sort of see why that comes in towards the end of the talk. After observing the policy and the message, the agent will choose some response R. Payoffs are going to depend on some hidden state of nature S. U superscript P gives the policymaker's utility. U superscript A gives the agent's utility. We're going to assume uh, for the purpose of this talk that the policy space, response space, and state space are finite. In the paper, we only assume that the state space, is, or we only need to assume that the state space is finite. Notice that all these spaces are abstract, right? So if we want to include things like you know, transfers in the policy space or allow the agent to sort of receive messages, sorry, agent to send messages to the policymaker, as we frequently have in mechanism design. Um, that's all, those are all things that you can incorporate by just defining things, by specifying things spaces appropriately. Okay, um, so that's the stage game. Let's talk about the repeated game. Uh, basically, this is just the stage game repeated over capital T periods. In period little t, the policymaker announces the policy PT, a message MT, agent chooses a response RT, and the state ST is observed. In the repeated game, the policymaker strategy, what we'll call a dynamic policy, is going to be a function from the history to some policy and message in the present period. And the agent strategy is going to be a function also from the history and the policy chosen by the policymaker and the message sent by the policymaker to a response in the present period. 
All right. Um, now let's talk about the policymakers regret and the agents regret. So the policymakers regret is going to be essentially the, the benchmark that we're trying to, to, to approximate. Um, so the policymakers regret is going to compare the um, his his sort of average payoff under the dynamic policy that we're proposing and the ex post optimal static policy P. So static policy P is one is just saying that the policymaker is going to choose P in each period, irrespective of the history. And ex post optimal says that after we observe the realized sequence of states, whatever it might be, um, we're going to choose the, we're going to look at the policy P that would have maximized the policymaker's utility. More formally, policymakers regret is defined as follows. The, you see the expression below has two parts. Left-hand side, we look at the um, average utility of the policymaker over time. If he uses the static policy P, highlighted in green, okay, given the sequence of states uh, S1 through ST, we're going to take the maximum overall static policies P. On the right-hand side, we see the policymaker's average utility under the dynamic policy that we propose, which generates a policy PT in each period, also highlighted in green. The only other difference between these two expressions, right, is on the left-hand side, we're looking at uh, the agent's response, our superscript PT, which is the agent's hypothetical response had the policymaker pursued the static policy P in every period. On the right-hand side, um, we see the response RT, which is going to be the response that the agent uh, makes when the policymaker follows the dynamic policy. Um, now, importantly, uh, the agent's response is if the policymaker used the uh, static policy P, it might be different <laughs> from if he had used the uh, uh, dynamic policy, right? Um, now, standard notions of regret, right, which are mostly developed or initially developed for the most part for um, you know, basically single decision maker problems, not these sort of interactive learning problems. Um, they implicitly assume that the that they would they would assume in this setting that uh, the RPT, so the hypothetical response on the static policy, is equal to is the same as the uh, hypothetical is, is the same as the response under the dynamic policy. Okay, we're not going to do that. Okay, this is what we call sort of assuming that the agent's behavior is exogenous. Right? But in our case, well, the agent's following a strategy that could depend on the history of policies, and so uh, potentially their behavior will depend on what the policymaker did. So our definition of policymaker's regret is going to take this into account. If we didn't take into account, this would be a very easy problem. Right? We could have the policymaker run exponential weights and guarantee no regret that way. Because we are thinking of you know, this um, you know, somewhat more carefully specified notion of regret, we're going to have to do more work and make, you know, impose more assumptions on the agent's behavior in order to get a, you know, compelling result. All right. Um, and finally, I just wanted to define the agent's uh, regret, or more precisely, the agent's external regret, um, which is going to be sort of the, the building block that, that we're going to, you know, refine later on. So the agent's external regret is going to be similar to the policymaker's regret. It's going to compare the repeated game strategy that the, the agent is using with the ex post optimal stage game strategy. So more formally, um, the agent's external ret is going to consist of you know, basically two parts, right, as before. On the left-hand side, we see the agent's uh, average utility using the stage game strategy H. Okay, a stage game strategy is going to be a map from uh, the policy and the message chosen by the policymaker to response R. Okay, it's not simply the response, right? Again, the, the stage game is basically an extensive form game. Um, and so uh, we can think of, uh, and so we want to have no regret with respect to the stage game strategy instead of just no regret with respect to the response, okay? Um, on the right-hand side, we see the agent's average utility under the repeat game strategy that they do use. All right. And next we're gonna move on to uh, thinking about the agent's behavior and imposing uh, sort of new behavioral assumptions. So a natural starting point for our work is to assume that the agent satisfies no regret. Um, this is natural because you know this is a kind of assumption that has been used in a lot of previous work um, in the literature on learning games and, and related papers. Unfortunately, in our setting, no regret is not going to be sufficient, right? So no regret is not going to rule out pathological behavior. And we can show formally that even if the agent satisfies no regret, there exist you know, algorithms that the agent might be using 
um, where the uh, policymaker is unable to guarantee low regret. Okay, so it's, it's simply not strong enough for us to get any kind of useful guarantee for the policymaker. Now, the, sort of intuitively, the reason why no regret is not enough in our, in our model is because there's a possibility that the agent has additional information, right? So that the agent is somehow able to forecast or appears able to forecast the state in a given period better than the policymaker, even though this information is not explicitly written into the model. Okay? So, so where does information come from? Well, remember that our problem is, is basically an adversarial um, our environment is essentially an adversarial environment, right? The adversary we can think of as choosing the sequence of states and the uh, the agent's uh, repeated game strategy, subject to whatever behavioral assumptions we make. Now, the adversary can always decide to sort of correlate the agent's actions with the states to make it appear as if the agent has additional information, right? This, this correlation is, is empirical, right? So if we look back at the end of time, ex post, right, we might see that there was, in fact, an empirical correlation between actions and states. And this is what we can interpret as information of the agent. Somewhat more informally, we can think of an agent that has access to additional data that we don't have access to or notices some pattern that we missed. All right, so let me give you a you know, simple analogy to, to, to provide some intuition for why information is a problem. Um, the analogy is going to be to the sort of classic fable of the tortoise and the hare. Okay, so we're gonna think of a the tortoise is corresponding to an uninformed agent, and the hare is corresponding to an informed agent. Now, if we ask a tortoise to finish a one kilometer race in an hour, right? The tortoise basically, you know, the tortoise finds this feasible, but basically has to go straight ahead as fast as it can in order to meet that requirement. Similarly, if we ask an uninformed agent to satisfy no red condition, the agent behaves in a way that we think of as sort of rational, right? Uh, basically does the empirically optimal thing, does something that is more or less mean based. On the other hand, if we ask a hare to finish the one clump race in an hour, well, the hare can do all kinds of things and still meet that requirement, right? Because it is, you know, because, because the requirement is very easy to satisfy. So the hare could, you know, go faster at the beginning, then stop, take detours, take breaks, what have you, and still satisfy our requirement. Similarly, an informed agent, because they have more information, find it very easy to satisfy no regret condition and can do things like accumulate no regret on some subset of the periods uh, and then do weird things, pathological things, things that are harmful to the policymaker in the remaining periods. Now, the natural resolution to the analogy is to say, okay, let's calibrate the sort of the amount of time allotted to finish the race to the speed of the animal, right? So we can ask the hare to travel the kilometer race in two minutes and basically ask to go straight ahead as fast as it can. We're gonna use the same idea here. We're gonna say that the informed agent should satisfy no regret conditioned on her information. And this is going to imply what we might regard as reasonable, rational behavior. Now, the difficulty is, of course, information is not something we explicitly wrote into the model. It's something that arose out of this adversarial problem. So we need something. We need to find something in the model to sort of identify the agent's information. The key idea here is that we can identify the agent's information with her behavior. Okay. More precisely, we can think of information as being revealed by the agent's behavior both on and off path. By on path, we mean the agent's behavior under the dynamic policy that we're proposing. By off path, we mean the agent's behavior under some hypothetical static policy. Okay. Now, since the policymaker is concerned with satisfying no regret condition, right, the policymaker cares about how the agent would have behaved had he done something different. Right? So, off-path behavior of the agent is going to be really important to um, you know, ensuring that the policymaker's problem is, is feasible. Now, a notion that you might already be aware of, um, calibration. Right? Calibration is basically a no-regret condition after conditioning on your on-path behavior. Right? So in a, sim, in, a sim, in, a somewhat, um, in a single decision maker problem, like say a forecasting problem, right? calibration sort of captures through past behavior, the agent's information. Right? Calibration is also known as no internal regret or no swap regret. But in our setting, we're actually going to have to refine calibration. We're going to have to refine it to what we call counterfactual calibration, which is also going to condition on off-path behavior. So it's also going to take into account information revealed through the agent's off-path behavior. Somewhat more formally, counterfactual calibration says that the agent must fully exploit her revealed information. 
Okay. Information in this case is going to be defined by the agent's uh, on and off path responses. So in period T, IT, the agent's information, is going to consist of the following vector, the policy PT and the message MT sent by the policymaker. This is the same context we use to define external red. The um, response RT chosen by the agent, this is what we would use to define calibration. And then in addition, the uh, responses that the agent would have taken had the policymaker chosen a had you know committed to a static policy p, and then that's for all p in the set of policies. So that's information. Counterfactual internal regret is simply going to be no regret with respect to a modification rule h, which maps information in a given period to some response for that period. So that's counterfactual calibration. That's our sort of basic rationality assumption. This is a way of thinking about uh, what does it mean to use your information fully and consistently um, in an ex post sense. That is to say, not in a world where we have a prior and we can you know, optimize ex ante, but in a world where um, you know, um, really all we, all we see is like the, the historical sequence of states, and then we have to evaluate, did the agent do something reasonable or not? Now, um, having defined counterfactual calibration, right, we might want to consider another further refinement. And that is to say, we might want to consider settings where in fact the agent does not have uh, uh, private information, right? So we needed to talk about private information in order to define our rationality assumption, right? To reason about what, what is sort of rational for the agent in this ex post sense. But we might then want to say, okay, let's, let's try and shut down this, this information. It might not be relevant to the problem that we're considering. So here's how to do it. So we're going to say that the agent is uninformed if the following two conditions hold. First, that she's counterfactually calibrated, right? In other words, her counterfactual internal regret is going to zero as the number of periods t grows to infinity. Second, that her external regret is non-negative. So this is a lower bound on the agent's external regret. Of course, usually we're imposing upper bounds on regret. Here we're imposing lower bound. Why does this capture uninformedness? Here's some intuition. The first condition says that the agent is fully exploiting her private information. The second condition is saying that the agent does not outperform the best use of public information. Well, if you're fully exploiting your private information and you're still not doing better than the best use of public information, your private information must not be very useful. Okay? So that's what uninformedness is capturing here. All right, so that's it for uh, the discussion of the agent's behavior. Um, of course, this is, you know, um, I think one of the key contributions of this work to even reason about what it means to be informed, uninformed, rational, not rational in this ex post sense in an adversarial environment. But now let's move on to the policymakers problem. Given the assumptions we've now specified, can we come up with a dynamic policy that uh, guarantees low regret for the policymaker? Our answer will be yes. So there are really three cases that we need to look at. Okay, so the first case that we're looking at here is where the agent is uninformed. Okay, so we're going to maintain our uninformed assumption. Another case that we can look at is where the agent is informed and we're trying to be robust to the agent's information. Okay, so this is something that we developed in the paper. Um, here, we're not necessarily going to guarantee vanishing regret for the policymaker, but we're going to be able to guarantee bounded regret. Finally, um, one thing you might want to do is sort of go even further and say, well, maybe we can adapt over time to the agent's information in the same way that we adapted to the sort of the environment itself. Okay. This is something that we're presently working on and I'm happy to talk more about offline. Okay, so um, our policy, the dynamic policy, what we're proposing, we'll call the calibrated policy. Here's how to construct it. Okay. So this is the algorithm, if you will. Um, we're going to be looking at the stage game with a common prime, right? So exactly what we wanted to avoid, we're going to be looking at that, um, and we're going to be sort of tweaking it to, con to come up with an algorithm that works well in this repeated game. So uh, the policymaker's problem in the stage game with a common prior is given by the, the following expression, right? So we're taking the maximum overall policies um, of the policymaker's expected utility given the prior, subject to the constraint that the agent is best responding given that prior. We're going to modify this in, in sort of four ways. First, we're going to replace the common prior 
with a probabilistic forecast. As given here, the forecast is going to be the output of a no internal regret algorithm in, a, in an auxiliary game where we predict the state subject to the quadratic score. So the details of that are not too important. Um, but basically, this is going to ensure that the forecast is calibrated. All right, so we have a calibrated probabilistic forecast, and there are methods we know how to construct these kinds of forecasts. All right, that's step one. Second step, now we're going to allow the agent to make mistakes. So instead of optimizing exactly, the agent will only epsilon optimize. And we're going to evaluate the policymaker's utility with respect to the worst case response of the agent, that is epsilon optimal. Now, this, we're going to use this, we need to introduce something like this, um, based for two reasons. First, to deal with possible miscalibration in our own forecast, right? So if we, if we have a somewhat miscalibrated forecast in a finite sample, um, then that's going to lead us to um, uh, lead us potentially to the, 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 the wrong estimate of the agent set of epsilon best responses. And so we need to add a little bit more of a buffer to make sure that we're not you know, missing out on uh, uh, possible behavior of the agent. Um, and similarly, we need to allow for the possibility that the agent's response itself is somewhat miscalibrated, again, in a finite sample. OK, That's step two. Step three, what I wrote down here, the, we're taking the, the worst case over all responses that are epsilon optimal. Instead of doing that, we want to take the worst case overall mixed responses that are epsilon optimal. Now, this might seem natural. Hopefully, it is. Um, you know, it's often in game theory that we are going to allow the agents to use mixed uh, strategies. But actually, it's going to play a pretty important role in terms of interpreting, um, uh, interpreting this problem and, and proving our results. So here, um, when we think about the, sort of the mixing probability in this sort of auxiliary game, described that, that I wrote down here. Um, we're going to think about the sort of probability that the agent is choosing a response as corresponding to sort of the frequency that the agent chooses that response over time in a repeated game. Now, if you only allowed for pure responses, um, that would basically allow us to capture um, mis sort of um, mistakes that the agent is making in the repeated game that are sort of frequent but mild. Right, so the agent you might satisfy a sort of a no regret condition where in finite samples she's uh, making mistakes that are you know she might be very frequently making a mistake, but the mistake cannot be too extreme. Otherwise, she would accumulate uh, too much regret. Mixed responses also allow us to capture the possibility that the agent is making a mistake that is rare but severe. Right, so you can satisfy a no regret condition where in a finite sample you um, you know make a really bad mistake but only in a couple periods so that like overall on average, it doesn't really impact your utility. Okay, final step. Um, I told you at the beginning that the policymaker could send messages to the agent. Here's where that comes in. We're going to allow the policymaker to send the forecast that you know, is described the cal calibrated probabilistic forecast as a message to the agent. Now, this is not going to directly affect the agent's payoffs. This is not something that the agent needs to, the agent does not need to use the policymaker's forecast. The agent's free to ignore it entirely, but it's going to ensure that the agent is not less informed than the policymaker. All right. So this, the solution to this is going to be giving the calibrated policy uh, in period T. And our theorem says that if the agent is uninformed, then the policymaker's regret from the calibrated policy just defined will vanish over time as long as the buffer epsilon is going to zero at an appropriate rate. Now, this requires two assumptions on the stage game, which I'll describe just informally, but more details in the paper. The first one says that in the common prior game, breaking ties in favor of the policymaker should be essentially without loss of optimality, sorry, without loss of generality, right? And this is a property that holds in many games, essentially a continu continuity condition with respect to epsilon. And the second condition, somewhat more unusual, um, basically says that private information, that is, if we gave the agent private information that was totally useless to her, then that would be neither especially helpful nor especially harmful to the policymaker. Okay? And this basically deals with a technical issue where um, the agent's tie-breaking rule might be correlated with the state. But under those two assumptions, we get sort of no regret in the, in the limit for the policymaker. Right. This is an asymptotic result, but in the paper, we have explicit finite sample bounds. OK, uh, time to conclude. Um, basically, when it comes to policy design, 
Repeated interaction can make up for a lack of prior knowledge, even in environments that are highly non-stationary. So what we argue here is that we can obtain better guarantees in a variety of single-agent mechanisms and problems without any loss of robustness. 